It's our second episode of Locked On Hornets where we look at a potential player out there the Hornets could go after on the trade market. And today we start our position previews for this upcoming season. All today on Locked On Hornets. You are Locked On Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, in a minute, cuz we live. We live. We live. <laughs> It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcast, and that includes YouTube, where you can always see Doug jam into the intro music. You can also find his work on his Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com, and I'm Walker Mail. You can listen to me on WFNZ every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m., and especially during football season. It'll come during the Hornets season as well. Hi, hi. But we live, in, we live in pain on the microphone, especially after an (laughs) 0 three start and the Hornets, they'll do it the same exact way. As soon as they tip off their regular season, hold on now, hold on now. I've looked at the schedule. I've got them starting three and oh, I've got the Hornets, uh, Pistons, Hawks, Nets, boom, boom, boom. That's three and oh for me. Was it last year that you found a way to give the Hornets a victory in every single game and have them go 82 and oh, yeah, they didn't quite get there. Uh, yeah. You know, some some things happened. Injuries, you know, I think prevented them from going 82 and 0. Uh, but we'll see this year. You know, we, so. if you want to do a whole schedule breakdown, if you want to take a couple of shows, I mean, look, we got lists. We've got yeah, who we wore it best. I mean, you're you're trying to add a lot here, and and look, the time is ticking down. I think we're like 16 days away uh-huh. from preseason action. So I don't know if you want to go down that road, but we'll go down that road. Well, if you go like you did last year, I don't know if you'll have quite as much research for an 82 and 0 prediction as you do for the nicknames. They they might they they should require the same amount, but the nickname research will have overtaken your schedule research, I have to imagine. <laughs> so maybe we just do this, maybe we just finish the list and then we can okay. do the schedule a little bit later on or as the schedule actually unfolds. Well, one guy that could possibly help us if you do have more injuries, a player that they could go after within the division, Doug, uh-huh. for a rival, a player they could pursue on the trade market. It could be Tyler Hero. Whoa! He's been linked to the Charlotte Hornets maybe once or twice, not necessarily by anybody reporting on anything that could happen. I feel like we fielded a lot of Tyler Hero questions, especially as it pertains to P.J. Washington being traded to Miami. Tyler Hero in the draft, they passed up on him for P.J. Washington, too. So a lot of the uh, Kentucky connection there. We're going fishing, perhaps one last time, before we get to the regular season. Do it, do it, do it, do it. got a big one. Yeah, there it is. Jake Fisher, he reports on Yahoo about the Damian Lillard trade, and this is what he has to say. If Portland ultimately does business with Miami, the Jazz, as well as the Bulls, the Hornets, and the Nets, are considered a team interested in landing Tyler Hero from the Heat. And there are plenty of executives who'd rather take Miami's best package if the Heat are so willing. That could include Hero and Nikola Jovic to go with Haquez, Caleb Martin, and more. Even Caleb Martin, that's hilarious. So what else do you want to say about the Jake Fisher report and how interested should Hornets fans be in Tyler Hero? Oh, an opportunity to get the right twin back? Maybe pair the twins back together again? I don't know. I thought about that first, too. Tyler Hero, (laughs) take it or leave it. I thought about getting the right twin. Uh, Look, all of these things get very complicated when you start to talk about three-team, four-team deals, especially this particular situation that has dragged on and on throughout this entire offseason. And it basically boils down to this. Miami has pieces. They want Damian Lillard, but they don't have the pieces that are entirely attractive Uh, for Portland to just pull the trigger on a deal. So they've got to find someone to take the things that Portland doesn't want. And one of the big pieces would be Tyler Hero. From a Hornets perspective, here's my take. If the Hornets acquired Tyler Hero for some package that wasn't ridiculous, that that hamstrung them financially, or, you know, they had to take back multiple long-term pieces or that they gave up a ton of draft compensation. Just say that, let's just say that Tyler Hero comes back for some reasonable Uh, output from the Charlotte Hornets. I think the deal doesn't make a lot of sense for next season or this coming season. But in the future, if Brandon Miller is the shooting guard of the future for this team and he develops quickly and he's able to be a defensive presence alongside LaMelo Ball, then Tyler Hero actually, to me, makes a ton of sense as a scorer off the bench. 
It's not as if this team performed particularly well offensively last season. There were injuries, yes, but the top five guys that that shot the basketball all were below average in terms of points per shot attempt. This is a bad offensive team. I think there are serious questions about whether Steve Clifford can still coach uh, offensive basketball in the NBA. If you look back at his time in Orlando, those teams were miserable offensively. Uh, you have to go all the way back to those the last time he coached Kimball Walker to find a team that even finished in the top 20 uh, in offense. This team needs offensive weapons. Tyler Hero is a legitimate uh, offensive weapon. If you actually, if you look at his points per shot attempt at 114, according to Cleaning the Glass, that would have represented the best points per shot attempt on the team last season, including LaBella Ball, even though, yeah, those numbers are a little skewed because he didn't play a lot of games, but it would be the best points per shot attempt for a non center on the Charlotte Hornets last season. So it would make a lot of sense if Brandon Miller ends up being uh, the defensive player that I think a lot of Hornets fans want him to be. Yeah, well, and and the other thing is, you know, he's 23 years old, so it's not like you're taking on this project. But, you know, maybe you are taking on somewhat of a guy that you hasn't hit his ceiling, but nobody would call Tyler Hero getting. a project. You get a six man of the year. The guy already has an award attached to his name, so that would be interesting. Six man of the year making 30 million dollars a season. It's a lot. You know, the Heat decided to pay up for him. They're a different team because they're actually going for championships even even if they got in as an eight seed last year this was a team that was built to go deep into the postseason they've made the finals a couple of years with jimmy butler as their star player tyler hero was a help for them the first go around what's interesting is he got injured last season Mm -hmm. was eligible to come back during their postseason run Mm -hmm. a big debate was do we bring him back because he's a liability defensively and we're mm-hmm. playing rough and rugged and we're playing pretty well defensively. That's somewhat of our, our identity right now going deep into the postseason. I don't think we bring him back. And eventually I don't even know if Tyler logged any games in the NBA finals also too. That's not entirely fair because you would expect some rust from Tyler hero coming back after an injury, but that was a real discussion point. <laughs> and the heat ultimately didn't have the help of Tyler as they got to the NBA postseason. They did it despite paying him close to $30 million a year. So that's all tough. Hornets mm-hmm. not in that situation. If he would mm-hmm. come off of the bench because you have him as a starting shooting guard, or you would, if, if you were to insert him in the starting lineup, he would mm-hmm. be, right beside LaMelo Ball. Man, if if we don't like not having anybody to help LaMelo defensively in the backcourt, now Tyler Hero does not fix that. And I hear your Brandon Miller case, but then you would shift Brandon Miller to the three and it would still be a problematic starting defensive backcourt. So I... I well, I don't or know. no. So what I what I'm saying in the future is that you would actually bring Hero off the bench again, and you would have you know you would have Brandon Miller and and off the bench meaning like he's playing because look he yeah. can play one two or three and actually it it doesn't make all the sense in the world for next season but if he can handle the basketball a little bit and give you know your because I would rather Tyler Hero take some of those point guard minutes that because the, the situation with the backcourt is not getting any worse. I mean you're you're gonna you're going to start Terry Rozier at the two. It's not like it's going to get worse yeah. with I don't think it gets worse with Hero. So and and by the way, I know you weren't making this argument, but I know someone will. They'll look at it and go, "Well, the Miami Heat decided that they couldn't play him in the NBA Finals, so why would the Hornets take it?" <laughs> I'm not taking any this guy didn't play in the NBA Finals argument when the Hornets haven't won a playoff series in 21 years, okay? <laughs> Let's worry about the NBA Finals after we win a playoff series. What a playoff game. Um, so, some playmaking to his name for assists the last couple of seasons. Um, now, to be fair, I don't know if it's like Terry Rozier playmaking where you don't want him as the point guard, even though his assists are decent. Um, but Tyler Hero can shoot, no doubt about it. Hasn't posted a three-point shooting season below 36%. That's what he did his sophomore year. Shot 38% on eight attempts per game last season in 67 appearances. So, I mean, was pretty healthy for the regular season, at least getting to that 65 game allotment that is instituted this year to win awards. So look, I like for me, Doug, ultimately, if I were to dwindle this down into one simple take, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't hate it. That's not the player that I would pursue in any trade, but I wouldn't hate it. I'm not, I'm not going to kill the Hornets for it. It just feels like a lot of money for a guy that doesn't fit crazy well with LaMelo defensively. Um, but, but I guess, you know, but him, him shooting 
it, it's a little bit like the Buddy Heald thing, right? It's just that's a lot of money. Buddy Heald mm-hmm. would come at $19 million on an expiring. Tyler Hero has three more years left on his deal after this upcoming season. So four, I don't know why I did that. But I think he's got four years, and he's going to be making above 30 at the end of it. Which I think is why this makes it complicated for the Bulls in particular, because they have so much uh, money invested in their core. I think why the Hornets could possibly take on this kind of risk in terms of the amount of money that you're paying Hero is because for so many seasons now, they have been just investing in young players. And so there's a lot of there, there are a lot of players over the next couple of seasons, including Mark Williams and Brandon Miller, that are going to be paying, playing a lot of minutes, but they're not going to be paying those players a lot of money. So you open yourself up for opportunities to bring in uh, <laughs> what would I think be considered a veteran player on this particular team, Tyler Hero. You have that opportunity where the Bulls, I think, are going to have to really think hard before they bring another $30 million onto the roster. If you look at some of the other teams, like in, just in terms of thinking about could this happen for the Hornets versus some of these other teams that are involved? You know, I don't think the Bulls are a big threat, but the Jazz and the Nets have proven that they're able mm-hmm. to pull off big deals. They're able to get involved in big deals. The Jazz did the deal with the Cavaliers to send Donovan Mitchell. Uh, they they got the Rudy Gobert deer, deal done. The And really, I think, scored on that deal for sure. And then the Brooklyn Nets were able to move on from Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving and actually have a decent playoff team. Now, they're one or two injuries away from from competing for the, the number one overall pick, so they have to be careful here as well. But I could see both the Jazz and the Nets being more competitive than the Hornets to get involved in this deal. So I don't, you know, and, and just looking at Kupchak's track record in terms of actually getting trade deals done, I would put the likelihood of this very slim, uh, but if it does happen, I'm with you. There are some concerns, but overall, you know, I, I think I think it could be a risk worth taking. Yeah, uh, just to finish this thing up, I don't even know what you would get rid of that would entice Miami enough to, or you, you know, I guess Portland is being involved in here too. But I don't even know what you would give up in order to because Portland doesn't want Tyler Hero. That's how this is happening. They right. just flat out don't want him, which is a little concerning too. For oh yeah, we'll take him. You know, you you don't want them. That's fine. Just dump them onto us. We'll be that third team as your dumping ground because you don't want Tyler Hero to grease the wheels on making this trade work. So it's it's not totally 100 percent fair. They are giving up what is a pretty good offensive player. So it doesn't make all the sense in the world. Like, I I guess I understand it uh, to a certain degree why Portland just doesn't want that money on the books. If they're going to rebuild, they trade Damian Lillard. So that right. that's really why. But he is 23 years old, and they still just say, nope, we don't we don't want him. You know, somebody else can have him. So a little interesting there. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the current players on the Charlotte Hornets. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We're going to be starting our position previews. It's time we go over the point guard position, starting with the franchise player and the depth behind that franchise player. We'll get to the position preview, the point guard preview in just a moment. This episode is brought to you by DoorDash. You've trusted, I've trusted DoorDash to deliver our restaurant favorites. And now you can get grocery delivery that actually delivers too. That's the point. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. You'll get exactly what you ordered or they will make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself. Want even more value than that? You can save all on your grocery. You can save on all your grocery and restaurant favorites with a zero dollar delivery fee on on eligible orders with a Dash Pass membership with easy substitutions right in the app and best in class customer support. DoorDash delivers groceries exactly how you want it. Get fifty percent off your DoorDash order up to a twenty dollar value when you use code Locked On NBA at checkout. Limited time offer. Terms apply. That's fifty percent. Off up to $20, no minimum subtotal, and zero delivery fees on your first order. When you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code LOCKEDONNBA, don't forget code LOCKEDONNBA for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. More Locked On Hornets coming up next. Before we get to this position preview, we said a lot of words in that last segment about Tyler Hero, whether it was a good idea or not for the Charlotte Hornets to trade for him. And I think we missed a big factor and that could sway some people in the direction of acquiring Tyler Hero. And that's it. that is, 
if Eric Collins is indeed going to be on the broadcast team, if Bally's doesn't go belly up and something weird happens and Eric Collins is still in the booth, like the moment that Tyler Hero hits a game-winning shot or a game-tying shot or even just a big shot in general, to, to hear what Eric Collins has in store for that name, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in. Is, is Eric Collins going to be singing Nickelback a lot more frequently if Tyler Hero is our player next year? If I have anything to do with it, we got to get him yeah. on. If that happens, we got to get him on and try to convince him to to give us a only a hero can save us. Uh, I want to hear Eric Collins. We don't hear him sing a ton. We just hear <laughs> the excellent vocals on the call. If we can get him to sing and go that deep for it, that would be great. Another thing about Tyler Hero is we need to figure out different ways to bring players onto the roster that have appeared in rap music videos. And Tyler Hero <laughs> would check that box off by appearing with Jack Harlow. So that is another reason why they should go after Tyler Hero. Just want to say that. Okay, let's move on to the position preview here, Doug. It's time. We're going down to each position. We're looking at the starter. We're looking at the pieces on the bench, maybe even beyond if we're talking about some Greensboro guys and whatnot. So point guard position preview it's here today it all starts with lamello um now we can start with lamello as the player as the franchise guy where do you want to start particularly with lamello on what you expect from him do you think he's going to improve in area x what do you want to talk about as far as our uh, star player goes? Well, I think, you know, we're going to dig down into each of these individual players as we get closer to camp. Uh, but I really just want to take a 30,000 foot view of the point guard position in general, maybe throw out a big question, one big question that we have about the position or even a player that's playing, because I think it's tough to <laughs> this one in particular, this position in particular is difficult to talk about because it's LaMelo Ball and then really no one else. I mean, you look at it, LaMelo Ball, they did bring in Frank Nielakina. Dennis Smith Jr., of course, goes to Brooklyn during the offseason. Uh, they The Hornets don't make him a priority. They uh, they reportedly offered him more money, but Brooklyn called first. And so DSJ, uh, you know, took his basketball and went to Brooklyn. So they've got Frank Nielakina. That's a big question mark. Uh, hasn't really shown an ability to be – a, an offensive player that's going to make defenses think at all uh, defensively. You know, he's, he's definitely in that DSJ range. Could he revitalize his career like DSJ? Big question mark there. And then behind him, it's, it's guys playing emergency duty. It's Terry Rozier again. It's if Cody Martin is healthy and ready to go, he's played some emergency point guard before. And then Teo Maladon, no news there, still a restricted free agent, still a qualifying offer out there, but is lost in cap space and was not mentioned at all during the PJ Washington press conference. So, and really it seems like they're set on roster spots. So I don't expect Teo Maladone back at this point. So it's really LaMelo ball. Yeah. And you're just as a franchise, you're just crossing your fingers and going, look, you know, if LaMelo ball gets hurt, season's over anyway. So why have a backup? I mean, that's, that's definitely a strategy. Uh, I, I believe, I, I think I've, I've talked about this quote before where I think it was Howard mud for the Indianapolis Colts. They were practicing, and Jim Sorgi, the backup quarterback for the Colts, got zero reps with the number ones, zero. And a reporter asked him, hey, why does Jim Sorgi not get any time with the ones? If you're, if Peyton Manning ever goes down, then he's not going to have any chemistry. And he says, buddy, if that man goes down right there, and he points to Peyton, he says, if that man goes down there, right, right over there, if he goes down, we're bleeped. And we don't practice bleeped. And it was a great quote from the Colts organization. That's what happens. Great right? name, too. Great name, too. Howard Mudd. I don't know if that's the actual guy. Could be Tom Moore. Either one of those, too. <laughs> Could get some great Colts. This brilliant, brilliant Colts. reporting on your part. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, yes. Don't want could've to been, put the Could have official... been this guy named Mudd. Could have been Tom Moore. Somebody said it. Somebody there with the Colts. Either way, the, the point stands with LaMelo. Yeah, that's my one big question, Doug. It th This is it with the point guard position. Is LaMelo Ball, solely LaMelo Ball, enough playmaking for this team? Last year, I think it proved to be somewhat true. If you look at his cleaning the glass stats, Doug, he is the one that made this offense thrive when he was in. And when he was off the floor, the offense tanked. You talked about Steve Clifford possibly not being able to coach a modern-day offense. Well, when LaMelo's on the floor, it makes things a lot easier for him. You look at points per 100 possessions when he's on the floor. Mm -hmm. 89th percentile with him there. Yeah. Effective field goal percentage for the team and how he affects it. 
92nd percentile. It increases by 3.2%. Turnover percentage is actually down despite LaMelo taking all these risks. Usually when you're that flashy, that great of a passer, I don't necessarily care about your turnovers being up. And yet the turnovers are down when he's out there on the floor. So on the flip side, the defensive stats, they tank when he's on the floor too. So LaMelo offensively, he's what makes this thing go. If you look defensively, he really is hurting the team. If you look at some of the advanced numbers on it, can you bring that up to where he's an average defender? If that's the case and he keeps those offensive numbers where they are, then he skyrockets, Doug. Like if you just look at average defense from LaMelo this upcoming season, then you're talking about LaMelo being a bona fide all-star that that's not really a discussion. If it comes up to an average level defensively, he's an all-star. It's all about maybe increasing defense and offense this upcoming season to where you can flirt with a top 15 spot, otherwise known as an all NBA selection. I want to go back to your first question there. Is there enough playmaking on this team? I think that's it's why, and we've discussed this before, why rushing to get rid of Gordon Hayward's uh, expiring deal, you have to be careful about that because what you're losing in Gordon Hayward, unless you bring something back that is equivalent, is you are losing additional playmaking with that starting unit. Mm-hmm. And you, I think it would be a, a slight bonus of bringing Tyler Hero is that he does offer you a little bit in that area. It's not like he's just shoot only. Um, he's operated in an offense in Miami that was very much about sharing the basketball, making, you know, making clean passes. I mean, that's they, they didn't you know, they, just, they didn't uh, they were a disciplined offense, just like they were a disciplined defense. So, you know, I think. There, there are some concerns there for sure. Is there enough playmaking on this team? Um, Brandon Miller would be a big question mark there too, right? As a rookie, is he going to be able to come in? I think you're just looking for him to make the right pass early on. But, but could he shock everyone and say, no, not only can I make the right pass, I actually see the floor a lot better than people gave me credit for, and I can be an additional playmaker off the bench. That would be a welcome surprise, but not something that I think you can really go in expecting of Brandon Miller in his first season. I think that's something that's got to, probably going to develop over the next couple of seasons. You're probably looking at Brandon Miller being a guy – much like Miles Bridges was in his first season, who stands in the corner a lot and waits for things to happen. And when the ball hits his hands, he's expected to knock down the shot. I think that's pr- more likely what his role is going to be early on. Uh, my big question is around LaMelo Ball. And, and, and I guess maybe just on the point guard position in general, but more about LaMelo Ball. It's can he stay disciplined this season? And, and it goes to your point about the defensive end of the floor. Can he cut out the fouling can he cut out the frustration foul after making a bad turnover on the offensive end you know he he fouls someone in the bonus you know fouling them and 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 resulting in free throws some of the things that that really make Steve Clifford's head pound can he cut some of that out of his game without losing what makes LaMelo LaMelo this is a question I think we've been asking since his rookie season can you hone that just raw, instinctual, beautiful energy that results in crazy behind-the-back passes you know, from the half-court line to Mason Plumlee for reverse jams. Can you, cut, can you cut down on some of the mistakes without losing the freedom and the creativity that makes LaMelo LaMelo? I think that's going to be the biggest question for the point guard position because you're right, there is no insurance. And so if he gets in foul trouble, it's not just about injury. If he gets in foul yeah. trouble, the domino effect of that c- can easily result in a loss where you would have won a game. So can you cut down on that? Can you get more discipline from the mellow ball this season without losing uh, what makes him him? I think it's not only a question for the point guard position. It's really a question that if it's answered in the affirmative, you can do that. Then you're talking about LaMelo ball, all NBA. 100%. I don't know if they do have any insurance because they didn't go out and fix that. They didn't go out and get any other player. It still should well, be Frank illegal. Milikina, that should be illegal. It's a, you know, it. you can't operate your motor vehicle in these United States of America without a little card. I mean, you can, but it's illegal without that little card to say, Hey, if something happens, I've got a plan, but apparently the Hornets can do that where they've done it with their center position for years. And now they're doing it with their point guard position. I'm calling yeah. the cops. Yeah. I'm calling the DMV. <laughs> 
we, we've gotten Doug to dial 911 after going over our first position preview. We've got plenty more to get to the rest of this week. Let's go to the last segment coming up on next FBI on the on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Uh, we have some rankings to talk. Rank Radio, it comes up in the very final segment of today's edition of Locked On Hornets. It's all coming next, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Doug ended last segment by wanting to call the law. Well, he called Law Murray of The Athletic. Rank Radio. He has a <laughs> rankings list of, I believe, the point guard position coming up on The Athletic here. Doug, what do you have for us? Uh, yeah, he did actually did all of the positions, which will be very helpful for us uh, during these position previews. He so he ranked... Uh, all the teams, and he has a, a variety of different criteria for these rankings. It's not just about LaMelo Ball. What is what is LaMelo Ball versus all the other point guards? He does factor in depth. Here are the, the criteria. Uh, basketball, uh, availability, injuries exist. There is uh, no if healthy because we know some players won't play. Players who are more injury or suspension prone make their reserves more relevant. Depth, even though they're not listed here, uh, Law looked into all 30 second units and factored that in. Uh, career and morale, actually wanting to play for the current team. How do those uh, starters stack up in terms of that? And so when you look at the point guard rankings, the Hornets come in right in the middle. Number 15, LaMelo Ball and company, number 15. I'll give you some of the teams around them. Cleveland ranked number 13 with Darius Garland and, and the depth behind him. And 14 was scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I'm trying to find number 14. I can't find number 14, but I'll tell you number 16 is the Clippers okay. with Russell Westbrook. Number 17 was Fred Van Vliet. And why is number 14 hiding from me? Where are you? Number 14. Well, while you're still looking for it, it sounds like a couple of the teams behind you are of guys that aren't on the LaMelo level. Now you brought up Russell Westbrook. You brought up Vets. Fred Van Vliet. Yeah. Fred Van Vliet oh, yeah. got paid a lot of money. So I, and Darius Garland, you said was in front of LaMelo ball in the Charlotte Hornets. I do wonder if LaMelo seems like what law did was divided into, okay, you have all the stars. LaMelo is at the very back end of what you would consider to the stars. And then we have everybody else. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Bradley Beal, number 14 for Phoenix, which is odd because Bradley Beal yeah, has, not played, point guard, but, <laughs> has played a yeah. lot of shooting guard. So he's, right. it's going to be it's going to be very interesting in Phoenix, you know, what what the ball handling responsibilities are going to be, which makes a lot of these position previews and rankings difficult because the game has changed a lot where you're not so locked into point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center, but I think it is healthy to look at just the playing groups uh that you're going to have to try to put together. But I I think this ranking honestly is a little is a little high. Uh, and, and it's not about LaMelo Ball. I think LaMelo Ball actually probably for law inflates the Hornets ranking overall because what we talked about in the first segment, the depth at this position is atrocious. And so if LaMelo Ball even has to miss a few games, um, it's, it's going to be difficult for the Hornets to figure out what all of that means. And so, you know, when I look at a couple of these other teams, I think, yeah, there's probably a little bit more depth at that position uh, but you look at the teams that have the the highest rankings, and it's it's obviously Steph Curry and it's Luka, but I'm going to give you number three on Law's ranking. You're not going to love it. You're going to get upset. You're uh -oh. going to feel feelings. It's a, it's a player that the Hornets drafted. It's Shea Gilgis-Alexander for Oklahoma City, number three. I knew it was coming. Yeah, no, I, I've I've dealt with that pain long ago, but it makes sense. And it, what I'm seeing here, though, Doug, is yeah, you're right. Like, I still think the Hornets are pretty solidly in the right spot because we both agree they don't have much depth at all at the point guard spot. Lamelo is doing all of the lifting to get this team to that average ranking. You look at other teams; it's not like they have great. Uh, at least when you're looking at Houston and L.A., it's not like they have a ton of depth there, too. The Clippers, you have Bones Highland alongside eight, Russell Westbrook. You know, maybe a coffee is in the backcourt, too, Amir Coffey. You look at Houston, where you have a bunch of young players there, and including Fred Van Vliet, who just got paid a boatload of money. You do have DJ Augustine, too, a former Bobcat. You wore a best. Uh, Anthony Mason wore a best. He was maybe second on that list. Not going to pass Anthony Mason. But Augustine's still doing it for the Houston Rockets. So I feel like the Hornets are in the right spot. Um, but you're right. It, 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 it's, a, it's a theme. If Lamelo goes down to injury or if he fouls 
or if you just need a good old-fashioned breather because you're not going to play him every single second. Are they going to get destroyed on the floor when LaMelo's not out there on the floor? Do you have enough of a defensive identity? Because that's that was the, the, the saving grace with Dennis Smith Jr. going out there in place of LaMelo is, okay, our team is going to shift. Our offense, him as an offensive player, he is not in the same stratosphere as LaMelo. But now we bring a defensive identity when Dennis Smith Jr. goes out there. Can Frank be good enough defensively? Is he even going to get that kind of rotation minutes? I mean, that's, you know, that's, is he even going to be on the team to that degree? And if he is, then will he bring the same kind of defensive identity when LaMelo goes to the bench to hold up and allow LaMelo to breathe a little bit? Yeah, the depth, it's not great, Doug, no doubt about it. I think the fact that they worked out Alfred Payton after acquiring Frank Nielakina tells you a little bit about their confidence level that Frank mm-hmm. Nielakina, who, I, you know, with Dallas was handling the ball a little bit, but was really a backup wing player, was not was not really tasked with, I think, a lot of backup point guard uh, minutes. Uh, but he's but he's shown he's he's capable of handling the basketball in the past. But, but no, I think LaMelo, I think you're right. LaMelo lifts this ranking because he, he, you just look at back at last season and he came back from those first couple of ankle injuries and, and there was a stretch there at the beginning of February, really to the end of February, that sort of crossed over the all-star break threshold where he was averaging more than 26 points and more and, and 11 assists. So from February 10th to the 24th, 26.4 points, 11 assists. Like if you can put something together like that and, and you're talking about LaMelo Ball winning player of the month a couple of those months early in the season, mm-hmm. then then yeah, if he's if he stays healthy, which is a big if because you've got all the ankle injuries, yes. The team seems a hundred percent confident that he's not not just like healthy, but like everything's fine. And if it continues to be fine, if he's done, we'll hear hopefully at Media Days that you know, that some steps are being taken or some steps have been taken that will prevent some of those things from happening in the future with the ankle. But you've also got the wrist situation that seemed to persist into year three. That was a surprise. The wrist injury yeah, that he suffered in that. year two. <laughs> like the moment that I see him do this kind of thing, the, the, and for those listening, it's the thing that he does when he plays with his wrist. Yeah. I'm going to continue to be worried about injury concerns. But if he stays healthy – and he can, and he's already proven that he can come back from an injury and go nuclear. Like if he continues to do that, then yeah, I mean, they do have at least an average uh, point guard position. All right. That'll do it. Thanks for making Locked On Hornets your first listen today. Make your second listen game to game NBA every moment, every top performance, every result during the regular season. Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the league with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow. I need a hero. 